Two seasons ago, back in season five, I started asking on this year's podcast for listeners to send in their what I called Stories in Ciderville, which is a segment for all the writers out there in Ciderville to have a platform to be able to share either your fiction or nonfiction stories that center around apples and palms. They have to be integrated into the storyline either way. And they're typically 3,000 words or less. This week, a hundred episodes since the last time I was able to feature a Stories in Ciderville, we have a new one to be able to share with you, which I think is perfect timing considering, well, the time of year. I'll have more on that coming up in this here episode 326 of Cider Chat. Hey, 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 apples, make them pop, pop, pop. Hey, 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 my name is Rhea Wincoller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. We'll be hearing our featured stories in Ciderville coming right up, but first, a wee bit of news from Out and About in Ciderville. The beloved longest running cider fest in the USA is returning this year, 2022, and it's being rebooted as Cider Days 2.0. It's going to be taking place, as always, the first weekend of November. So start setting your date now to be heading to Western Mass to attend Cider Days 2.0. On Friday night, November 4th, we'll be kicking off with a Calvados and American Apple Brandy tasting. Then on Saturday morning at 9 a.m., you'll be able to attend a workshop with John Bunker. Based up at Super Chili Farm in Maine, I've had John Bunker on the podcast a couple of times. I'll put links in the show notes to that. And on this coming Saturdays 2.0, he's going to be talking specifically about starting and nurturing your own small scale orchard. Now, a small scale orchard of this size for this particular workshop is within the range of 10 trees or less. We want to make it really attainable for homeowners who don't have a lot of acreage. Maybe you want to do some high density planting or you just want one or two trees. How do you go about doing that? What are some of the considerations? Truthfully, John Bunker could do like a week long workshop. The guy has so much info. In fact, in 2019, he released his most current book called Apples and the Art of Detection because he is the dude to bring on site when you're trying to figure out what that tree is out there in the backyard. Was it grafted or is it a seedling that was just dropped by a bird? flying by. He has so much to offer. Check out his book. I also have links in the show notes to Apples and the Art of Detection. And make your plans now to be heading to Western Massachusetts for the first weekend of November for Cider Days 2.0 to do one of our most favorite things of all during this annual fest, which is to say, here, you want to try this? It's so true that we love saying, here, you want to try this? It's like the quintessential phrase that you hear at Cider Days. And I was just talking about that with Paul Carrenti, who is one of the founders of Cider Days. In fact, the book that he wrote called The Art of Cider Making was one of the catalysts for Cider Days, which was started back in 1994. Paul and I had a sit-down recording, which you'll be hearing coming up in the queue on Cider Chat shortly, and we were able to talk about what he is currently doing with cider and also about the art of cider making, why that book was written, which is so interesting, actually some stuff that I didn't realize at the time, and the beginnings of Cider Days, how it was started and the people, the key players that were involved. So look forward to that coming up. We are so geared up for this here November missing people so much. I just really can't wait to see you in person. And of course, to say, here, you want to try this. All right, I'll be right back with a little bit more and our featured presentation called Stories in Ciderville. (laughs) 
Coming up this September 2nd through the 4th is the annual Ross Cider Fest, which takes place at the Ross on Y Cider and Perry Company. And it was really started initially by Mike Johnson. He started that as long ago as Cider Days kind of kicked off, you know, back around 1994 or so. And now his two sons, Albert and Martin, are helping out and a whole bunch of volunteers, wonderful people. There's a ton of makers from the region that come there. There's camping on site. And of course, there's also lots of nice local places to stay. You get to visit the U Tree Pub. I mean, what's not to love about that? Drinking cider, having food, and then there's music to dance away into the night. Just a really rock solid time. You get to like wall away out in the orchard, camping and caring about your cider. I got to attend back in 2019, and I cannot wait to go back. Not this year. But I will be there. You could be guaranteed of that. I want to bring a whole bunch of folks on a tour to the UK. So stay tuned for that. In fact, if you want to go to the UK with me, send me an email. Don't hesitate to do that. Say, hey, you know what? I hear you want to do a tour to the UK so I don't have to drive on the left side of the street and I could drink wildly while I'm there. Not not excessively. Okay, we're, we're safe people. <laughs> but, you know, drink and be able to cruise around the, the area and not worry about that send an email to info at Cider Chat. Anyways, I digress. Ross Ross Cider Fest is taking place September 2nd through the 4th. Check it out uh, at their website, rosscider.com. And then one other uh, patron I want to mention, uh, Ross and and Space Time Mead and uh, Cider Works, they're also patrons of Cider Chat. And I'm just digging, Dan, I'm digging your new website, the the main photo is like a sliver of the moon and then there is an astronaut laying back on it with their hand on their belly it is a cool 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 logo it's really really cool check it out at space time meet and cider works good folks so there's a number of patrons on the podcast i'm not going to mention you all now i love you to pieces thank you so much for being part of the cider chat family and keeping the good vibes going keeping us all interconnected because people really really rely on this news here i know you do and hearing what other folks are doing in other parts of the world so thanks again and Don't you know, you could become a patron too. Just check out the Patreon page for Cider Chat. It's spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N or hit the donate button at ciderchat.com. On this holiday week, we just celebrated 4th of July here in the USA. A little bit of a different 4th of July for many because, well, there was just so much going on in the world, don't you know? So I thought it was perfect to be able to share this very special Stories in Ciderville with you this week. It's a little bit more condensed of an episode than normal, but I know you got a lot going on. And also because, well, the actual title of this story is called Orchards in the Winter. So this is my special tip of the glass to all you folks there in the Southern Hemisphere who are now celebrating your midwinter time. In fact, you know, the folks in Tasmania, they're going to be having their wassail, the the Huan uh, Midwinter Fest is going on there. Your winter time, your trees are naked right now. I love that time of the year when you could actually see the tree limbs and the sun is coming through in areas that it doesn't normally come in through. It's just just a cool time. And meanwhile, here in the Northern Hemisphere, we are smack in the middle. Even though summer solstice just happened in June, I do see the July 15th kind of time as like smack in the middle of summer because the days are starting to get shorter. Don't you know? (laughs) I don't want to bum you out, but that is the way that the cycle goes, isn't it? Anywho, um, this special stories in Ciderville is coming from our friend Alan Supernaut, who was last on the podcast this season on episode 312 in the episode titled Some Angels Dress Like Bears, a tribute to orchardist and author Michael Phillips, who passed away too suddenly just this year in his own orchard. And uh, Alan uh, was a good friend of Michael. So we had to sit down and we were able to talk about his work because he really touched so many people's lives uh, all over across the land in the U.S. And wouldn't you know it, <laughs> so interestingly, Alan was kind of catching up on Cider Chat and he heard me mention a number of episodes ago, probably in season five, that I was looking for stories in Ciderville, these like, you know, 
four minute or less, 3,000 words or so stories that could be fiction or nonfiction that have to do with the integration of apples or pears, palms in general, orchards, you know, cider making in the story. And he wrote to me and said, hey, you still looking for that? And I said, sure, send it my way. And that's what he sent me here. He recorded it. This actually took place in a in a not a sermon because I don't think he's a preacher, but uh, it took place in his for his congregation, which is up in Ashfield, Massachusetts. So his fellow parishioners. Uh, I, I didn't really get the backstory on it, and I liked it because he he does again give a nod to Michael Phillips in this. It's very touching, but he's talking about human relationships and and the similarity with orchards too, and the nurturing around it, and also nurturing for ourselves, which I think is absolutely timely right now. I think a lot of us need that reminder to really nurture ourselves, to slow down, and so much caregiving is going out in the world for so many different situations, and how much do we do that for ourselves? So I hope this provides a reminder for you to seek that and also to look wider at your own interconnectivity with other humans and your relationships. I believe that's what Alan is trying to provide us here. And you could take it even further, if you will. And now let's go to this reading by Alan Supernot of Brook Farm Orchard based in Ashfield, Massachusetts, titled Orchards in the Winter. When we think of an orchard... We think of eating fruit in the crisp fall sunshine. We think of the wonderful fragrance of the trees in bloom, the gentle colors of the blossoms, the soft breeze that blows the petals around our feet. But what of the orchard in winter, when the trees sleep, limbs akimbo against a bed of snow? We can learn a lot from spending time with the orchard now, at this quiet time of year, observing what, on the surface, may seem unobservable. There's a lot to learn about ourselves as well. There are many parallels between our lives and lives of the trees. Winter dormancy finds the orchard patiently waiting for a new year in the beginning of another growing cycle. This can be a time of patience and unfolding for us as well, as we anticipate and plan what's next in our lives and how we might help grow. There's little to do and much to be, loving, appreciative, optimistic, excited, as we wait for spring. How might we do this quietly the way the trees do? Perhaps we just sit and watch them and be still as the light changes into spring and the wind blows. Snow on the horizontal limbs of a well-pruned fruit tree allows us to clearly see its bones, the structure that supports the bearing of a very good crop. The fruit buds have already formed last summer. They will absorb the sunlight and ripen the fruit to its utmost potential. What does it mean for our lives to have good bones and structure that supports us in bearing fruit? Good friends? Work we love, self-care, balance in what we do. What feeds us in our lives and how might we absorb in our ripening? A fruit tree should be pruned each year. Removing what isn't needed helps the fruit grow. Sometimes, looking down at a growing pile of discarded wood, it seems like I'm taking an awful lot away. But I'm paring down to what is essential for and about the tree so it becomes more of itself. It's an art, this figuring out of what to keep, and well worth it, because what grows now will be healthy, productive, and strong. Proving our own lives can be equally as challenging as we figure out learning as we go, which I've done with these trees, what is essential about and for us? What might we discard and know that no longer serves us? An assumption, a belief, a story that limits us or the people that we know? How might we prune our relationships so they grow and yield the best that we and others might have to offer? Some of the branches I cut in the winter are called scions. These are saved for grafting onto rootstock in the spring. You make new trees this way, 
by gently inserting new wood into old, binding together the two together, fed by the soil and the sun, they become one. What parts of others might we take into ourselves to grow something new? How might our branches find new life as we grow and change over the years? Each winter, I work hard to prune the orchard well, and I have time to think about these things as I do. I believe all this watching and waiting makes me better with the trees. I'm more able to understand the way they grow, what they need, how they respond to weather and light. I try something and then I pause for a minute, for a month, or maybe a year and wait and see what happens, what the trees and my experience will tell me. It makes me better with my life as well. I'm more able to let time and people take their natural course. I can see more clearly what someone needs in order to feel safe or productive or loved. Teaching people about trees and orcharding gives me the opportunity to share not just the technical things, like which limbs to take, what varieties to choose, how to hold the knife just so to make a good graft, but also my experience with the orchard as a place of profound learning and quiet and ultimately delight. It's a place to find balance in our often dizzying lives. I think there's a part of each of us that longs for tree time, where we sit and watch and wait for the little and the not so little things we do to blossom and make fruit. That time is here, that time is in the orchard in the winter. I recently lost a very dear friend of mine, a fellow orchardist, uh, we were soulmates for 30 some odd years, and I'm really still feeling the weight of that loss of him. When I learned of his death from his wife, I went into the orchard and pruned a tree in his honor. I talked to him, I wept, it's gonna get me again, and I pruned. From that day on, it'll always be his tree. In the piece that I just read, I mentioned tree time. This is an understanding about how I think trees perceive time, different than many of us modern humans. Tree time is measured in seasons, and it proceeds slower than other time measurements, like nanoseconds. The trees don't measure time in 144 characters. I've learned a lot from their example. These trees and all trees are sentient beings. I see and feel God in each one of us. I see, see and feel God in everyone in this congregation. God is in each one of us, and we are in God. Because of how I understand this fact of God being in each one of us, I am able to focus on what I have in common with people and not focus on what I don't have in common. This builds trust between people. Then. If and when a disagreement arises, we are starting from a place of trust and not a place of distrust. This trust helps us communicate with each other. The trees in the orchard also find what they have in common, starting with the soil, the earth that they are rooted in. This earth gives them life and enables them to produce apples and peaches and pears and plums. And to this I say, yum. <laughs> Plums, yum, you know, yum. Okay. <laughs> there are many varieties in the orchard, and they all live together side by side, and they grow together side by side. We can learn from that. Over the years, the orchard trees have become old friends to me. We have an ongoing relationship. Like with my human friends, some are young, and some are old. Some of the trees die, perhaps by disease or for another reason. Some of the human friends I have have died, and some have moved on. When a tree in the orchard dies, I can replant another one. When a longtime friend dies, I hope to find new friends, both young and old. Our congregation is like my orchard. Many different people, many varieties, all together in the same place, all friends.
Thank you, Alan Supernut of Brookfield Farm, located in Ashfield, Massachusetts, for sending in your piece titled Orchards in the Winter for Stories in Ciderville. If you out there in Ciderville have a story like Alan, you can send one my way. It must be 3,000 words or less, and we're looking for four minutes or less of audio, but as you can see, we go sometimes over. It has to be Apple and Palms must be integrated into the storyline, and it needs to be recorded. You need to pre-record it. You can do that on your smartphone. Just hit the voice recorder and start reading, and then send it my way, and we'll edit as needed. You just send that to info at ciderchat.com and just put in the subject, Stories in Ciderville. And before we totally depart from this piece, Orchards in the Winter, I wanted to say two things about it. One is during the pandemic, it has totally been about pruning away the essential from the non-essential in my life. And I imagine you out there in Ciderville could probably agree that you have done the same too. I mean, we couldn't help but not do that during these two years and and the initial pause that we all had to take worldwide at the same time. I mean, that is what's going to happen. And in many ways, it's a really, really good thing. And in terms of finding solace in the orchard, that is the place that I find my center. And it reminds me to take a step back and to take the whole picture in. That's what a tree does to you. You know, you don't just look at the the trunk, you look at the whole canopy. And then one third thought, (laughs) this is a little bit off topic here, but when I can't sleep at night and I'm having really difficulty because I'm, you know, just thinking, 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 I go to the trees and I think about bark, which could be the most mundane thing in the world to think about, but it slows my mind. It's like counting sheep. I just think about bark. Uh, So for instance, if it's an apple tree, I start thinking about the color of the bark. I'll think about one particular tree and and how, you know, maybe there's like a, a little mark on that particular tree and I'll start peeling it away in my mind and just going deeper and deeper and eventually I'm able to fall asleep. So trees help me sleep on top of helping me find a little bit of calm in my soul and rooted foundation in my feet and mind. So there's a lot to be gained there. Please, once again, if you have a story in Ciderville that you'd like to share, send it this way to info at ciderchat.com. We'd love to hear your thoughts, your your inspirations, and your wandering, because that is what Cider encourages us or I to do, which is to look out beyond the cup and to see the whole of the world. And with that, I leave you here. This is Real Wind Caller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. Strange apples, bitter shop. Strange apples, juicy and ripe. I want a tan and bomb. Who wants to pull them down? I'm gonna pull them down. Hey, 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 apples. Bittersweet. Strange apples. Hanging high. Got them strange apples. Forget the pie. Pop, 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 ba-da-boom, doo-doo-da. Who 
wants a tan and bomb? I want a tan and bomb. Who wants to pull them down? I'm gonna pull them down. Hey, 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 hey apples. Come and see. Plenty strange apples for you and me. Bop, 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 bop,